All right, welcome to the show. Today, our guest is going to be Clark Chamberlain, but um, and we're going to talk about editing and all sorts of good stuff because we get that question a lot. Like, how do you how do you work with an editor? How do you find a good editor? What are the things that editors help you with? Those are all sort of the same question, but uh, yeah. So that's <laughs> that's what we're doing. It's just nobody knows what anybody is doing today. We're just very okay. Just lost. a warning: Johnny is discombobulated today. He's, I'm discombobulated. He's discombobulated, but but it's good. We're here for you anyway. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw Dave under the bus and say, what's something cool, Dave? Uh, Luke Cage on Netflix. Oh, I haven't started that. We were just talking about what we wanted to watch next, and that was a contender. How is it? Very good. It's, um, I mean, if you watched him on Jessica Jones, you kind of know what to expect. Uh, all of that and more. Uh, really good. How does it compare to Jessica Jones? Uh, it's hard. Like, I just feel like they all kind of go together. Like, they, they feel like I don't like to compare one to the other because, like, each time there's a new one, I watch it and I'm like, oh, this is really awesome. And I never. I never get that thing where, well, this isn't as good as that. Each one feels a little bit better than the last one. So, How did you like Jessica Jones compared to Daredevil season one, just as a franchise versus franchise? Um, I liked it a lot. I don't remember thinking I didn't, so I don't know. It, it's hard for me to compare and contrast. Like I could compare and contrast X-Men movies and shit like that more easily. but Because I, they're apples to apples? I don't know. Maybe because there there are like ten to thirteen episodes, and it just feels like a longer experience. So there's ups and downs, and it's kind of harder to judge it as a whole how it stacks up. Uh, I think I like Daredevil season two more than Daredevil season one. I think that's a because I like uh, the Punisher. Yeah, I did too. Um, I'm, I'm looking at Jeff in the chat, and he liked uh, Daredevil season um, <clears throat> Daredevil season one better than Daredevil season two. Um, but I, I liked season two. Um, season one, actually, season one had the kingpin, though, like heavy, and he was so good. So maybe, maybe that's true. Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, the whole like slamming, I, I just wrote beats for something yesterday and referenced the slamming the car door um, <laughs> scene because that scene is just so good. Yeah, I, I want to watch the cage. We're just finishing up um, uh, Mr. Robot season two. Oh. Yeah, Sean, Sean included a reference to Mr. Robot season two in the beats for Tomorrow Gene and uh, Tomorrow Gene 2. Okay, and just I so highlighted you know, it and you've said, done it oh, I haven't gotten this far yet, fucker. Okay, you also, have, you also haven't announced the name of that book. I did a few episodes ago and then you yelled at me. <laughs> but are we announcing Wait, wait did I just, oh, okay. Well, apparently we're both announcing it. Awesome. So, anyway, yeah, I'm discombobulated. Bye. Leave me alone. <laughs> well, I wasn't done with my uh, discussion. Yeah, <laughs> Which, wait, nobody knows what's going on here. Go ahead, continue your discussion. Well, uh, well, Beth said nobody. Uh, do I take it Gotham sucks for most people? Gotham is one of those situations where my, my TV, my 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 cable carrier has a situation where they run like uh, you can watch shows on demand. So. Like when it first came out, I uh, it was like a few weeks after the fact, and I saw the first one. I liked it a lot, and then I was going to catch up. But then they decided they were just going to get rid of like all but the last few episodes. So if you want to watch them, you got to pay. And I said, well, fuck that. I'm not paying. So I never got to catch up and watch it. Uh, I I know I think it's probably on Netflix or Amazon, so I could watch it. I liked what I saw, but because of the because of the way the cable carrier acts. Or the networks, however, whoever works out shit where they, 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 they ha sometimes they'll have a whole season that you can watch on demand. Other times they got nothing or just the last few episodes. And I get very annoyed by that. And like, if you're going to like just dangle that carrot and then snatch it from me when I go to eat it, fuck you. I'm not going to watch you. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I like a lot about Gotham. I think it does some things very, very well. But I don't think it knows where it wants to go as a whole. It feels too network to me where like they don't know. I love 10 episodes, 12 episodes. It seems like you can tell a really tight story when it's 22 episodes. It just, it's not as succinct a narrative. And it also, I really feel those commercial breaks. Like the, the, the writing is written around that, <clears throat> that tempo. It's just, I don't know. It's just not as, not as exciting to me, but yeah, Mr. Robot, we will, we'll finish probably tomorrow. Um, that one episode, Dave, you told me about it. Like a, a long time ago but the the one where it's like shot in 420 uh-huh yeah oh 
<laughs> my. That's not just like the best episode of Mr. Robot. It's one of the best episodes of TV I've seen because it's what it does in each act is just kind of amazing. And I like I just, the Alpha appearance. Don't say too much. Yeah, I, I, I won't. I won't. But but I will just I say that I finally got ahead of Sean on something and now he's ahead of me again. Well, that's why I put it in the beats. It didn't even occur to me that you hadn't seen that yet. Because well, I'm not watching it with my wife like you are. So I have to get it in oh. like here and there and stuff. Right. Oh, well, then I'm sorry I ruined that for you because it is a pretty awesome scene. But but I just I feel like um, that that episode made Mr. Robot like, OK, well, I was really enjoying the show. But then that episode made it. Well, clearly, this show is going to be a classic. Where are you in season two? I'm at the very end. I have two episodes to go. Oh, so you already had that second twist reveal. Yes. Did yes. you like it? I loved it. I think Did the show is fantastic. Coming? Did you see uh, it coming? No, 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 I didn't. <laughs> I like these things that where number one is both of your something cools, not just Dave's. Sean jumps in on the something cool, and <laughs> nobody who hasn't seen it can appreciate what the fuck you're talking about. That's pretty well, great. Yeah, mystery boxes. All right, well, I'll do, I'll, do, um, I'll do something cool. Actually, there was a story I was telling right before we started, and I said, oh, I should, I should tease that for, for something cool. And I don't remember what it was. Dave, help me out here. What story was I telling right before we started broadcasting? I don't know. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> you think I remember anything? No, I guess not. Shit. All right. Well, <clears throat> my something cool is um, story jacket. All right. <laughs> is that like a straight jacket? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a life jacket for your story. It's like, what if, what if your story could not sink? That's a story jacket. <laughs> do you want, do you're not going to ask me about that or you want to ask later tell us about it or no, Wait, I'll this is the later. most awkward thing ever <laughs> no, I'll tell you later. i love that i'm the one who doesn't know what's going on today <laughs> um yeah okay so uh, all right so i my something cool something. is one that actually got bumped a while ago and i was trying to decide if it was cool enough for the show because it doesn't really have anything to do with anything that we do here but it's just kind of a cool creative thing and so I had actually decided not to something cool this. And then I told it to Sean. He was like, oh, like that is awesome. It's the Amy's ice oh. cream thing. So. Um, oh, I know what this is. Okay. I thought it was the pistachio that, that Christine slacked us from the airport. Or did you not see that? No, I did. But yeah, out of context, that doesn't make any fucking sense either. <laughs> Remember that pistachio that Christine texted us? No, well, this is kind of an amazing story. So the, um, the if you, there's a local Austin uh, ice cream chain called Amy's. Uh, it's actually Amy's Ice Creams. They have more than yeah. one. Amy's Ice Creams. <laughs> and um, that's kind of an Austin institution. And uh, my family, we, we went into one of them and we just, uh, some girls came in, some teen girls came in, they asked for like, hey, are you hiring? And the guy gave them like a stack of like thick papers and they left. And I was just like, nothing on them, by the way. I was just like, what the fuck just happened here? And then, I looked over at the guy and like, what, what it just happened there? And he was like, well, it, you'd think they'd want some instructions. I'm like, ha, 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 yeah, I know what you're talking about. And then they came back in and they didn't know what to do. And the, the PS on this was that they were, um, like if you imagine like the, a, a brown paper lunch bag that we um, you know, used to get your lunch packed for school in one of those little bags, but they were white. So they're like the exact same bag, but that's what he had handed them. And he handed them two white paper bags that were like lunch bags. And um, I said, I didn't you give them a job application? He said, well, that is our job application. And um, Amy's Ice Cream's job application is they give you a blank for, I don't even know why it's a bag. Like it could have been a piece of paper. They <laughs> give you a blank white it. paper bag. No, you, you dr they say, go draw something on it. Go put, do something, decorate this bag. And um, some of the ones for current employees were up. And the guy's like, well, look up there, there's like some of ours. And the one that I remember was um, <laughs> the alpaca from- <laughs> Austin. The, the, the <laughs> alpaca. He was okay, wearing wait, pork pie hat. Hold on. Let me, finish, let me finish the story. So the one that I remember was the alpaca from Napoleon Dynamite. Um, and it said, Tina, you fat lard. And it had the, the alpaca. And just some other like just funny, weird, quirky shit. And I said, is that really your job application? You, you just say draw in a bag? And he said, yeah, that's it. Like we just, and they just hire the people who they think are the best fit because it's kind of a quirky, strange place. And I just thought, I thought that was cool. I would draw like a <laughs> I don't want it. I know what you would draw. <laughs> I've seen what you would draw. But no, but do I we disagree that draw. that would tell them they shouldn't hire you? Like, I mean, it's an accurate thing, apparently. 
Um, I think it's kind of amazing. Like, I mean, it's scooping ice cream, right? Like that's a, that's a really good first job. And what does that show you? It shows you a little bit of personality and Dave, do you think that's an amazing thing or a stupid thing? A little bit of both. Uh, I, I I draw a giant penis, like ejaculating an ice cream cone. I don't think they'd hire you. And I'm not even like, why are you laughing? Like this is an original thought. That's what everyone knew you were going to say. Right. I think we could have done a blind thing where we all wrote down, what is Dave going to draw? And that would have been it for like 90% of people. Yeah. Because if you fill out an application, you could put any shit you want on an application. Right. But that, that proves a little bit of your personality. I think it's pretty cool. You know, speaking of, of hiring and the things that, you know, people do right and wrong, do you, do you know that the one thing that really makes a book like either stand out or fail in the marketplace? Definitely not a cover because fuck that. <laughs> what do you What do you think, Dave? Book covers? No, no. It's 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 bad plot development. As if the person like needed a developmental edit, like you know, say a life jacket to keep their story afloat. Wow, that, that is quite interesting. <laughs> so this was. <laughs> you're supposed to roll along. There was even a little script. So fuck you, Dave. Sean, you're my partner on this. Awesome. I've been waiting for this forever. <laughs> Put me in, coach. <laughs> I'm ready to play. Oh. So I guess you'd better tell us what the hell you were talking about earlier. Oh, well, a story jacket. A story jacket is something amazing where you're... Does Hitler you're, wear them? Um, well, okay, like let's say he was trying to tell his, you know, his people about invading Poland, right? But probably his plan had some plot holes <laughs> and he would have like, he needed a story jacket. He needed somebody to say, this is how you invade Poland. And <laughs> this is how you, this is your exit plan. This is what you do. But you're saying story jacket will help <laughs> you figure out the best way to invade countries and annihilate Jews. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, wasn't bringing, I actually wasn't bringing the Jews into it because I personally thought that was too far. What if I wanted to write a story about ayahuasca, but it didn't make any sense? Um, well, I think a story about ayahuasca is allowed to not make um, very much sense. It's going to take uh, Dave a while to get the hang of this, I think. <laughs> Oh, Logan has a good point that he heard Trump bought a story jacket after the last debate. I think, I think that if Trump had story jackets, he would, Hillary would have already bowed out. It's only because Trump doesn't know about story jackets that this whole debate. Well, thing is what about. is a story jacket, Sean? Because I have no idea. Story jacket is like, um, it's like armor for your story it's like it's like katana blades for your story it's like your story is all four of the ninja turtles and you've got the bow staff the katana blades the size and what's the other one could, oh, you, sucks. could you be more specific as to what it actually is can okay. you find a way to wear glory holes into this at all <laughs> okay <laughs> All right, what a story jacket actually is is it's um you know when you get your your outline critiques or your your full-on your novel's done and you give it to a developmental editor and it's like, oh my God, there's a hundred thousand words of barf on this page. And then it comes back with all these notes and you spend like eight years of your life and like a million dollars trying to fix this error when you could have just bought a story jacket ahead of time, got your outline critiqued and just nailed that rough draft. So a story so jacket- So is this like a developmental edit, Sean? Like my book is done and I take it to my developmental editor and pay $60,000 to have this done? This is like, if you were smart and you could, okay, imagine you have a DeLorean and you could go, you know, 85, 88, 88 miles per hour back to the time before you wrote your terrible draft. Or at least to the beginning of this ad read. <laughs> to the beginning of this ad read. And you could buy a story jacket for, you know, way less than an entire developmental edit. And then you get all your notes, all your critique, everything is in place, your beats are set, and then boom, you nail your story. Who would do a service like this? I can't imagine anyone qualified to do a developmental edit, a developmental, like a story coaching, basically. On, on Are there the, teams of people that are waiting to do this? Zillions of them. We have zillions of people standing by at Sterling Stone right now in the Story Jacket factory. In fact, do you see that smoke in the distance? That's smoke from our Story Jacket factory. I thought it was smoke from the uh, crematoriums. 
<laughs> no, it took it too far again. Wow. <laughs> Why would you do that? All right, bring it home. Bring it home. Bring it home. Um, so story jackets. Um, it's uh, sterlingstone.net forward slash story jacket. Okay, but he didn't actually really say what they are. So I'll do that. I'll be the person who says that. It's um, this gentleman right here. This is uh, Clark Chamberlain, our in-house editor at Sterling and Stone, doing a limited number of um, story, like developmental edits for beats, basically. Like telling you if your story is on track or whether you're going to get 60,000 words into it. Be like, well, fuck, I didn't see that gaping plot hole. And um, what are the details on it? When it's available? How often? Price? What are the details, Sean? Well, Clark, but I'm well, thinking I was actually, he's like, doing I was so great actually, right now. Well, okay, so so just a little like method behind the madness here. That was supposed to be terrible, and we were actually going to have a lucid, um, you know, what it is at the end of the show after talking to to Clark. Um, but you can go to sterlingandstone.net forward slash story jacket, and it will explain it. But it is actually, all jokes aside, it is a serious thing. Um, we brought Clark on, and we could talk about that a little bit at the end of the show. Um, but we're basically kind of moving into a model where we're, we're taking care of, of Sterling and Stone's needs and then saying, okay, this is, this is something we're doing in-house. Now, how can we help the community at large? And Story Jacket was kind of the first thing that was born under that new paradigm. And um, <laughs> yeah, there are some funny shenanigans with the 99 design stuff, and we could talk about that later, but that's a different show. Um, but for now, we did decide to start advertising for ourselves. And that first train wreck, um, there will be many more of those to come. That was- Why are you explaining the Andy Kaufman? This is just, well, well, none of this was, off, was, was authorized. None of it. <laughs> none of it went according to plan. Dave didn't play along right. Sean fucked it up and giggled too much. There's no CTA in this ad read, and Sean just explained it. Well, the CTA will come later. Let's start talking All right. about it. It's, a, it's, a CTA, it's an ad read. With a cliffhanger, at this point, I will welcome Clark to the show, Clark Chamberlain. And I will also say, I know we've obviously talked before, but sort of hi again, Clark, because <laughs> thanks to the segmentation of the company now, now, I never interact with Clark at all. And so like there's this stuff and Sean talks to him and and, and it's just like, well, the Clark's part of our company. And it's so yeah, and in fact, just yeah. yesterday, I started a, a new Slack channel that's like Story Studio. And it's like, okay, we have to, or no, no, it was in Asana. Uh, and it's like, okay, well, here is like, you know, production stuff that we'll talk about. And those are separate conversations. So yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting the way that the company is maturing and where we have these little partitions. But we're really, <laughs> as much as we're getting into education and things like that next year, we're even doubling down on story more. Um, we want to create more stories and, and get them better. And Clark is just kind of like an ace on, um, we, you know, we asked him um, earlier, like, what kinds of things do you want to talk about? He had power of story, emotionally connecting to the reader. Um, one thing I really like that Clark said that you can elaborate on in a second is how everybody is a storyteller, um, but that doesn't mean they understand story. And I like that dimension because I always say, you know, <clears throat> anyone can tell a story. And, um, and while that's true, uh, I think Clark is coming from the position of, yeah, but not everyone can tell a story well. And that's kind of his specialty. And before, uh, uh, before we get going, and then I go get a drink because I did, forgot to get one earlier, um, I'll just mention that the, the stories that you're going to see coming out, the new books coming out from us across the board uh, in 2017 have gone through the, the in-house version of Story Jacket process. Like um, Sean has written beats and then giving them to Clark, who then says, well, this would work better here. Or what if you introduced this guy here? Or what if you made this guy a little more of a mystery? And um, we did that a lot with, um, with the first book that I wrote, really to market on the new uh, model that we're trying to use. And it was great. So I'll just mention that. Yeah, 100% of our work now will be story jacketed <laughs> because <laughs> although we just came up with that term, like, I don't know, was it a week ago or something? Um, but Clark has been a, a really instrumental part of this process now for... Um, I don't know. How long has it been, Clark? Six weeks? Yeah, so? it's like six weeks now. So, and I just wanted to say, I figured the reason why Johnny and I don't interact is just because he doesn't like me. It's no, because I'm too intense. intense. Yeah, it's it, intense. It's because I'm intense. Sean is our like beats guy, editor guy, and we'll hang out. <laughs> actually, right. I, I think I think Johnny's actually kind of jealous, Clark, because he does. He's like, you get to do all the story stuff, and so you know, as as we evolve, the company, I'm just a word monkey. <laughs> well, we keep, we keep talking about that. Like as the company evolves, Johnny wants to get more into like world building and script writing and, and that kind of stuff. But we're we're still just trying to grow, so it's you know we're all plugging holes where we can. 
Yeah. So, it, um, first of all, thanks for letting me be on the show today. Like, oh, I'm of course. Really You're welcome. Thank you for yeah. being here. Yeah, yeah it, uh, it's just a weird feeling because, you know, I mean, it's like two, almost three years ago, I'm, I'm listening to the show while I'm driving back and forth to school and while I'm going to, to work and everything like that. And now I'm here. And so it's just kind of one of those circle of life deals, I guess. And uh, it's kind of a fun feeling. So. Oh, well, welcome. You've been a, a great addition. To <laughs> it's been fun. Yeah, I, I, I've actually, um, the, the, I don't know, the confidence that I have now is even better. Like, I, I, I like telling a story. I love the beats process. I love all of that. But knowing that um, normally I, I, I have this whole thing and then it gets passed off, right? Mm-hmm. And now, you know, since Johnny already blew the tomorrow gene, I'll continue to blow that a little <laughs> bit. Um, but yeah, I was, I was working on the, the tomorrow gene uh, two beats and you know, I, I've already done one version of them and then Johnny gave me, gave me some feedback and then I was, you know, massaging those further. And then as I was doing that this morning, I said, oh, I can't wait to, I'm going to pass them to you on Sunday, Clark. I said, I can't wait to pass these to Clark because that's like, I know that when it gets to Johnny for that final point you know before he reads them Mm -hmm. that's going to give him gas and in fact i told you this story already i think i've told the audience and but dave like dave for for i won't blow the name of that project but for the project that dave and i are working on um i think your work really helped to juice him because he wasn't necessarily on board with the whole production model and getting all the beats in place and you story jacketed those um (laughs) you know his beats for this last one and when he got them back he was like I'm in love. I'm ready to write. And he actually had 10. I don't know if you know this part though, Clark, he had mm-hmm. 10 days of like, and Dave was averaging about 300 words a day on a total average. Yeah. <laughs> and then this, la- no, 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 before this. Oh, okay. And then, you know, if, if you look at the last several months, mm-hmm. that was the average, but for like a 10 day stretch, he was at about 3000 a day. So Dave had 10 X his output thanks to like this new process. And then he had a data crash and lost all of his. <laughs> Yeah. And <laughs> which is very sad. I'm not laughing. It, it, it just really was such a, a sad thing to hear. And you it's so Dave, it. right? Like, of yeah. course, Dave, like so. the most paranoid guy any of us knows, didn't back up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and it's a it's a different experience um, for for a writer to come at this um, with sharing their story so early in the process. It's uh, like when I, when I'm teaching in school, um, it's one of the things that I find most authors and new writers, they don't want to share because they're so scared of other people stealing their idea or uh, judging them. Those lines. Yeah, exactly. That they, they don't want to, to open up, but when you can, when you can find that good editor, whether it's me or it's someone else who really understands what it is you're trying to do and can to rework it, it's just, it, it's going to cut down so much time, you know, in your process. Yeah. And I think that the getting over that, I mean, one of the things that's kept us from doing this in house for so long is because we had each other. Right. So, um, you know, if I'm, if, if I'm writing a story with Dave, I know I have Dave, he knows he has me, we're the sounding board. Same with me and Johnny. Mm-hmm. But bringing in an outside person, like it, it, it just doesn't matter. I mean, we love the collaboration thing so much. So this was actually easy for us to see. This isn't something we didn't think we needed so much as something we had to iterate into. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, okay, well, um, even if it didn't speed us up at all, um, how could it not improve our quality just a little bit? Because it's that, it's that outside voice. Mm-hmm. And you know, Johnny and I were talking about this earlier in the week that the the value here is like, we get those, you you tell yourself the story enough times, then you're really doing the same work. But having somebody else who doesn't know your story and Mm -hmm. doesn't have any attachment to your story at all, they're just coming in and they're looking at the the building blocks. They're looking, do these things fit together? Mm -hmm. Is is it emotionally resonant? Um, You know, we all talk about the obligatory scenes, right? And I think that you're really good at looking at, okay, does this have the right obligatory scenes? It's not just, is this an awesome story told in the right order? You're like, okay, for this genre, you need to have the scene. Right. And, and so you want to talk about obligatory scenes and how to make them fresh? Well, yeah. So, I mean, you're going to approach each one of your genres, of course, is going to have its own things that people expect. I mean, that's the, the point of storytelling is we want to go back all the time. Like, for instance, you know, when I saw Captain America Winter Soldier, I, I was blown away by that movie. It was a fantastic movie. And when Captain America Civil War is coming out, I'm talking to my son. I'm like, I just want to go back and watch Captain America Winter Soldier, but different. Right. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> like and that's that's what you want to be able to do every time this genre reader comes to this. They want to have the same story 
just different. And so it's, it's finding those key points. Um, and each one of the genres is going to be different, but, uh, it's finding those key points and then figuring out a way to just turn it just a little bit on its head, um, in order to, to do something that is unique, because of course, like we know, like every story has been told, like there's not a new story out there to be told, but the characters can be different. How we can, uh, how we can present it can be different. Um, even changing just what kind of point of view you're using. You can take these things and make them so much more unique. Everyone seems to say that the Captain America movies are good, but I hated the first one so much I've been reticent to actually mm -hmm. watch the others. So <laughs> one more vote for it, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Skip the first one. Go to those second two. They are amazing. I wanted yeah, my both, money back. Both the there. second two are super good, dude. Mm -hmm. They really are. So one of the things I, and I'm totally getting off track. Well, it's still story, but, um, <laughs> you know, winter. You're in winter, good company. Go off track all you <laughs> Winter Soldier, though, I mean, what was great about it, it wasn't a superhero movie. It was a spy thriller that had a superhero in it. And, that, it, like, coming mm. at a project with that different point of view changed the whole thing, you know. And instead of coming at it with the whole normal superhero tropes, you're coming at it with the spy thriller tropes, and then you're tossing a superhero in on top of it. And that was the big change. You know, that was the, uni the unique thing in it. That oh, yeah. When you, awesome. can, when you can effectively um, mesh two genres, that's, mm -hmm. that's like a secret weapon. But it's so hard to effectively do because you yeah. end up being one or the other, or you do it in a in a gonzo way like unicorn western right like not, it's not <laughs> well, i thought of this today when writing um you know uh dead city is coming out in ebook and paperback on tuesday so by the time this goes live it will be out uh the 18th. do you think we'll do an awkward yeah. awkward ad read for that next next friday maybe um but it uh it the, the point is it's not really a normal zombie movie like it it has a lot of the zombie tropes but it's really a thriller. It, it's actually a political thriller. We, mm -hmm. It's like Woodward and Bernstein. It's like there's a, you know, a, a whistleblower and there's a big corporation that that a secret that's being slowly exposed. And throat, we, we can do deep throat in the end range. <laughs> oh, throat. Dave's <laughs> on it already. Dave's on it. I'm Dave's making guy. notes. But I think that's that's a really good point. Is just you take the same story and you just shift you know, add a new element, change it around, change the POV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to do that a lot when we first started, except I don't think we did it with the precision you need to be commercially successful. Right. You know, and it, it, there's a difference between taking this idea and this idea and thinking that's a cool mashup. I would love to do that. And thinking, okay, well, this is what readers of this genre expect. And this is what readers of this genre expect. And now I'm going to blend them together to give them this totally new thing that they totally know what's going to happen. Like it's, right. they understand how to, not necessarily what to anticipate, but how to anticipate. And, and I think something you mentioned just right before and then kind of reiterated there is exactly correct that you take two of these things, but you can't actually meet the demands of both genres. You've got to choose one over the other that has more of those tropes in it. Because if you're trying to meet both of them, then all of a sudden, yeah, exactly. You have this thing that's neither one or the other. Right. So you, you have to know, that means knowing your story, but right. it also means knowing your reader, right? Because right. you have right. to know what she wants, uh, what she expects to read, because otherwise you're, you've got a 50-50 shot of disappointing or just out of the gate because yeah. you're, you're, you're guessing. Right. Because that, I mean, that's the whole thing. It's a spy thriller that has a superhero in it versus it's a superhero that happens to be a spy. I mean, those are two very vastly different stories and which points you're going to hit more of in that, uh, in those tropes. So, so why is it since, I mean, we're really talking about the same story being told every, you know, over and over and over and people want the same thing, but different. So why is it that writer beginning writers, I don't think you see this with like old pros, like, yeah. or maybe you do, you tell me, but I think if, if, by the time you've written a bunch of books, like I'm not scared of somebody stealing my idea at all right? Mm -hmm. Like whatever, I know it's not that original and I can come up with another one tomorrow, right? But new writers are really precious with every idea. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that is? And what do you think the best antidote for that is? So I'm really not actually 100% positive about why it happens, but yes, it does happen across the board. And um, I think the best antidote for it is that you have to have someone that you can open up and share that story with. Like you actually have to say it out loud because until that happens, you know, the, it, you'll never know how bad the story is or how good the story is until you can start to articulate it and bring it forward. And once you can start to understand like um, um, 
the one uh, shoot, I can't even think what it's called, but the idea of taking like the same story beats and handing it to every different imprint, you're going to get a different story right. out of it, right? Like every single author is going to be able to tell that story uniquely their own. That's just how it is. And like, once they can understand that, then all of a sudden it like opens up a whole different door to them because then they're out there and they're not afraid to say, yeah, this is what I'm thinking about with the story. This is what I want to do. And then someone can be like, Oh, you mean like this movie or like this book? Or they can be like, that's a ridiculous idea, you know, or just like once you start saying it out loud, you're like, Oh my goodness, I have no idea. What, okay, what do you say to like Dave, right? So, so Dave, a lot of times we'll be talking to, I mean, That's it's a sound question. What do you say to Dave? <laughs> <laughs> so if you're, if, if, if you're Dave and you're, you're in a story meeting with Sean and he pitches something and then you'll say, okay, well, that's like such and such. Like mm -hmm. that's something that he's, he's afraid of. Okay. I'm worried about that idea already being out there. And right. So, so how do you answer, how do you answer Dave who thinks the idea is already out there? Okay. So the idea, cause again, we can go to like uh, Christopher Booker's seven basic plots. Like that's it. Like the, the story is already out there. Okay, so let me give you a more firm example. When we did a, uh, when we did a book for 47 North, we had this genius idea or Sean did said, <laughs> um, let's, do Walking Dead meets Hunger Games, and we added like you know 1984 into it, and uh -huh. we did that. And so, what would you say? And I said, well, I don't know, man. People are gonna tear us apart. Well, and what was the uh, what ended up happening? Did they tear you apart? Some people yes. did. Some people yeah. loved it. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I think it's just how much are you copying straight up, and how much are you? you know, we copy. We copy practically nothing. We we, we uh -huh. took like two elements from it, and still people okay. Kind of yes, but it. wait, it was in the product description though, and so yeah. when you put it in the product description, you are putting a target. Well, everybody thought yeah. that was a genius idea to do that. Put it in the product description. <laughs> well, everybody. <laughs> for, for sales, it was like, I mean, 47 North knew how to leverage that. They knew how to move that. They didn't do anything with Monstrous, our follow up, because it didn't have that hook. So it's like we could have done a better job. If we'd had control of that book, we would have been able to manage those expectations a little bit differently. But even so, Dave's right. That is a much more obvious um version of that right i think oftentimes it's just like so what something is a little bit like something else then use that as your like platform to think of something totally different but at least there's your inspiration yeah and i mean it's an easier way to pitch people it's like this meets this i mean that's that's simple um but i mean it, talking about the hunger games i mean that uh how much shit did she get for battle royale battle royale right yeah <laughs> you know i mean the, they're the same story but uh but also uniquely different you know yeah, they, you, you look at our all, all our one star z reviews and they t mention hunger games and you look at all hunger games one star reviews and they mention battle royale yeah exactly <laughs> it's so, <is> paying forward <laughs> right and so i i don't know that you're ever going to get away from uh from having people hate on you um if it's similar but uh trying to find the similarities so that you can really hook someone in and then actually make it uniquely different I mean, it's, that's where our work comes in, right? I mean, that's the editing oh, yeah. that's and, doing in and working hard and uh, making sure that you're telling a different type of story than what was done before. And I think that that's the, that's the fun part. It's like when, when I was first outlining a lot of stories, <clears throat> I mean, sometimes we leaned into them. Like with Unicorn Western, we really lean into some very obvious structure and very obvious tropes because that was part of the game for that, that series. But there's been other times where we're we're trying hard to do the opposite, and we're saying like, how can we how can we not be cliche? How can we not be tropey? <laughs> but that's actually costing us readers. Like you have to know what your context is. We don't want to be right. cliche or tropey in Devil May Care because that is a very specific kind of story we're telling. But in, if we're telling a a sci-fi story um, and we're writing it commercially and trying to, you know connect with this very particular audience, then we need to know what kind of book they want so we can give them that experience that they're looking for. Otherwise, they're just going to feel shortchanged. Exactly. You know, I mean, it's why uh, Harlequin Romance has it down to a science of how many pages or how much of the word count is in each and every single one of the books. Like it's down to the science. This is what's going to be in there and they're going to eat it up. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's really cool because if you're a working writer, then you can look at those and th those formulas weren't there by accident. They right. have over, they, they evolved over a period of time based on like consumer behavior. 
right? So that's actually kind of fascinating when you look at that. And if you can attach yourself and say, hey, that works for me and that works for me and that works for me. And, and I know that's what I'm so excited about us actually, excuse me, having a developmental editor in house is that it changes the way that we're constructing beats. And I'm noticing this now with every project because it used to be about, about what happens next because that's what excites me most in you know that, that structure. It's like, what are we gonna talk about in the story meetings and how is this story gonna unfold? But now it's almost like, okay, the cool events are here. Now let's you know run it through Clark and talk about structure and make sure that all the things that, like here's a bunch of cool stuff. Now let's make sure the structure is in place mm -hmm. and the order of events is right and that all the emotional impact is there. Cause I know emotional impact is a really big thing for you. So oh, you wanna talk about that. Yeah, that's absolutely huge because um, when I started trying to figure out uh, and I don't know if anyone knows my quick brief history, but like the first book I did, um, I had a couple of guys who said they would do the editing and um, I'd written it while I was serving over in Iraq uh, with U.S. Army. And uh, it went out, you know, and like made, uh, sold 2,000 some copies, you know, like uh, and made some money and like beat Stephen King and Patterson for a little bit. And then all the bad reviews came in, right? Because they were just gaming the Amazon system with the algorithms and just bumped the, you know, bumped it up with some freebies. And then, uh, then it hit some high numbers. And uh, it was at that point that I was like, I want to do this right. You know, I want to figure this stuff out and make sure that I really understand story, not just the structure of story, but the psycho the psychology behind why we even read. And so that's when it really comes into it. Like, like understanding the emotional impact that you can leave with the reader and understanding how you can connect them to the protagonist so that they'll not only end the book, but then be excited enough to tell someone else about it because that's what it is. Right. I tell everyone about captain America winter soldier because I get it connected the right way, you know, and that's what you have to be able to do. And you've got to, um, I think anybody who comes uh, trying to do commercial writing and they don't know where it is that they're trying to go with the book, you know, like have an end goal, like know what they're going to leave the reader with when they close the book is selling themselves short because they don't understand what it is that they're trying to do yet. Right. So how can you possibly, um, it's like, um, saying I'm going to have a great date with this woman. Mm -hmm. It's going to be awesome. And then you pick her up and you have no idea where you're going to go. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you're like, Oh, maybe we'll get a bite to eat. But if you just took the time to plan that out ahead and I, I have it on good authority that women love indecisiveness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Beth, Beth asked, this is a good question. Can Clark edit any genre or specialize in certain ones? So we we're, we're doing a few things with uh, romance next year and the way we kind of looked at it in house was that um, romance is um, one thing that's just its thing, and then everything else is its other thing. So you want to talk about that, Clark? The different genres, and then there's romance. Yeah. So um, I I would tackle romance on occasion, but uh, the truth is, you know, if you've got someone who really just understands that, because it is such a nit not niche, but it's just such a um, assembly line production. You know, that it, that's really great. You know, like mine comes in, uh, my best expertise comes in thrillers, but then understanding how the other genres work, I can dive into those because um, the story ends up being the same uh, in a lot of places. Just that you have to learn the tropes and figure out what's going on next. So um, definitely can hit those when you need them. But uh, yeah, I would definitely like to have someone else that's handling just the romance because they know it. You know, I mean, that's when you get to that point that you want to have someone who knows the work that you're trying to do. And that's really true, just knowing your genre, period, uh -huh. whether you're a writer or an editor or um, an outliner, it doesn't matter. Like the, the more you know your, and that's, that's the problem when people are trying to write to market that they, the mistake they make is going for, okay, well, this market obviously has a lot of readers. I'm going to write to that market. But if you don't read there and you never right. have, you kind of don't have a chance because you don't know why that market is successful. You don't know why that story works. Yeah. Besides the Twilight books and a couple of Nicholas Sparks things, I haven't read much of romance at all. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, not running in there and voraciously reading it like I do with thrillers or with, uh, um, with fantasy, you know, modern fan or uh, urban fantasy and um, some horror as well. I do enjoy that. What do you think is the most complicated um, story type? Like for plot or you mean just for genre or story? Like what, what do you mean? Um, just to like, I, I guess 
to please the reader? Like what's the most demanding? Like romance is both, romance is weird because it's both super easy to please the reader because the, the architecture is so straightforward. Um, but you also have to really earn that respect for the yeah. reader. So the, the, the romance authors who are killing it, they have a bond with their reader and they have a relationship and that has been nurtured for some time. So um, if romance can both be really difficult and really hard in that way, what's something that's just pretty straightforward? I think pretty straightforward difficult is epic fantasy because you get to the point where you're trying to either um, you're just giving away way too much backstory. You're just giving a whole bunch of needless information versus the, um, the huge world building that those people want, you know, that they really want to get in depth in that world. But that's a fine line that you're walking between actually getting in depth in a world and having all these characters that are connecting together and then just bogging them down with all of your research that you did. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like. I, I think sci-fi and fantasy, when it's done badly, they both they they both like open up with these giant just chunks of exposition. Mm-hmm. Like you have to understand my world before you understand yeah. what's going on. Like no, no <laughs> you understand your characters. You can kind of squeeze that other stuff in. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, that's uh, it, we can't we can't uh, talk down to the reader. You know, you got to give them a, a chance to figure some stuff out. And plus when you start dumping in all the exposition, you're missing out on an opportunity to add mystery and mystery should be in every single book. So keep so, them, keep them turning the page. One, one of the questions I have, you know, regarding, you know, you, you want to write something, you know, that, that delivers the experience that, uh, that people want. Like if, it, like, let's say I was going to do a walking dead, um, I, I wanted to write a story like to, to serve the walking dead audience, but you have to also realize that there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there already like that. How do you mm-hmm. recognize the, the, what's been just done to oh. fucking death? And oh, yeah. them? <laughs> well, um, I definitely think that once it's hit, uh, hit the um, CW that you definitely, it's been <laughs> overdone. Um, <laughs> Like at that point, you can see that's over. Um, yeah, I mean, you would take a look. Uh, one of my uh, mentors, um, uh, Robert Farland, McFarland, he has this great idea about when you take a look at what happened 50 years ago. And uh, he says that there's a cycle every 50 years that things are happening. It was really interesting that uh, when you looked at uh, when all the vampire stories were coming up that 50 years ago, there was a whole bunch of vampire stories that were really popular as well. So, um, but yeah. Are you at the, t- you know, are you, did you get on the train at the right time or are you just trying to jump on and all of a sudden there's just way too much stuff that's out there. You definitely got to do your market research, see how many are out there at that time, see what the indie world is pushed into at that point. Um, yeah. And what, uh, what's the, what's the trad publishers starting to do? You know, what's their next year look like? You know, have they moved away from that genre or that particular story type? Like, vampires being overdone or zombies being overdone so you think you think you should definitely avoid something if it if it's been done to death uh, done. There, there's no way to make it unique or it's not worth the, the, the well i think you're going to get lost in a sea of uh, of already too many voices that are out there mm-hmm. um but uh but also what i'm saying is that in another 50 years it's good to go again I don't think I'm gonna be around another fifty years. <laughs> <laughs> you just set your clock, Dave. Just set the clock. Years, boom. Well, you know, like uh, uh, you know, Tolkien. Like they keep finding stuff from him. Like right? that's all you got to do, Dave. You just plan it all out. You've got them all written there, and you're like, you just publish this one on this date, whether I'm here or not. <laughs> you can do that, Dave. <laughs> Come on, set it up. All right, I'll get right on that. <laughs> it's like auto blogging, but with you know. Work. <laughs> So, um, so yeah. Okay. So, so what's, what's something when people are doing these, these outlines, like what's the mm-hmm. big mistake that people are consistently making that's keeping them from telling, uh, not just the story they want to tell, but the story that is going to resonate with a reader and make them, you know, want everything else that author has written. You know, a lot, uh, in the outlines comes at the beginning. There's a lot more problems with the setup. Um, there's a, there's a tendency to jump because we have that uh, old term in media rest, you know, we're in the middle, the idea of like jumping into action, which is really important, but people jump into the wrong action. Like we still need to still establish that the world, like the normalcy of the world, what's the, what's the character like at work, at play, at rest, before they get in to choose to jump into the plot. And so some people uh, in those outlines, you know, it's just 
diving right into the plot and we never get any chance to see what the difference is going to be between these changes that take place. It, well, okay. And what, what about a character? So do you, do you feel like, um, because when I'm reading stuff, I, I feel like that's something that seems to get missed a lot is the, the people aren't necessarily making, it, it's like they'll give their character a choice, but it's not that hard of a choice, right? right. It's like, do you want to get kicked in the face or go to Disneyland? Right? <laughs> and so the, it's, it's, I would choose kicked in the face. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's, it's for, for the characters. It becomes a really straightforward thing. But if you have like the choice between two amazing things um, or two terrible things, like that's better, but they have to be so like Sophie's choice, right. Is like the best right. example of two terrible choices. There's nothing good there. Or, um, you know, a, a like Dave's every day. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dave's every day. So the, if you have like a, a story where there's two good things and maybe it's, you know, a, a guy has to choose between getting the girl or getting the job, right? It's the dream job he's always wanted. And here's the dream girl he's always wanted. And he has to choose between those two things um, or, or, you know, losing his job or losing his, his wife. Mm -hmm. Like that could be that type of thing, right? Where it's a, it's a hard decision. But I see a lot of times in stories that, that they, they paint by the numbers in so far as this has to happen and this has to happen and this has to happen. They miss the, the, <laughs> Okay, get a drink. They miss the big why behind that. Right. Their, their, their characters are making the wrong choices because they're just not that important to the story. There's not actually any gravity. So how do you recognize that in your, in your draft, but also just in your outline if you're preparing ahead of time? How do you know when your emotional stakes are high enough? Um, definitely when you're going through the out, when I go through an outline, it's pretty easy to tell whether they understand their character or not. Um, I, I go along and then I ask questions. I write them out to the side. You know, is this what they're going to really feel? Like, is this really the, the question that they're going to come up with, you know, that they're going to do want to do this. Um, and then sometimes it's just asking that question because unfortunately for me, when I get a, when I get an outline, I don't have the author's head. Like I, I, I don't right. know <laughs> everything. That yeah, they, I think you need to make that a prerequisite. Yes. <laughs> Send me your mind. Send the outline and the author's head. <laughs> because, uh, you know, that they may understand that already in their mind. They just didn't articulate it on the word that they sent to me. Um, so sometimes it's going back and forth and just pointing those out. Um, definitely for anybody who's writing, you know, like understanding what your character cares about. And why I'm a very big proponent of the, the, the protagonist has to choose to enter the plot. Like they have to make that choice. Um, even if it's, you know, when uh, Aunt, uh, Aunt Beru dies, you know, like it's an easier choice to make to take off with Obi-Wan. But, uh, but the, he, Luke Skywalker still makes a choice to enter the rest of the story, right? You know, like, and why would they make that choice? Why would they do this every single time? So it does come down to understanding what it is that your character really wants. And I love that when you can figure out what your character wants, because then you can make their life worse, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's important and then you can take it away from them. <laughs> well, and, you, you want, you, you want this whole thing where it's like an actual growth, right? So somebody mm -hmm. who is like some of the character development, it's not just the choices that they make. It's about the, the journey they have as a human being is not that big a deal. Right. right. Yeah. Like, uh, what, what will actually change you? So like the Godfather is, is a great example here because the character arc is so amazing. This guy is like, he doesn't want to be anything like his family. He's not motivated by revenge. He's not, he's not driven in that way. He's, he, he went in the army. Like he was, he was good. He was going to be a Senator, right? right. He, he was as opposite of his family as he can be, but slowly things are taken away from him and then he gets in revenge and then, Spoiler alert if you haven't seen The Godfather. <laughs> Don't spoil The Godfather for <laughs> me. He basically, I actually think Dave hasn't seen The Godfather. I'm not even kidding. I, I have. It's about the mafia. <laughs> I saw the third one. Oh, <laughs> no. no. I, 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 have, I, bought all three, I bought all three and I'm you know, looking forward to watching them. He saw that and Joey. <laughs> 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 right but it is it is one of the best character arcs of all time right mm -hmm. because it's so there's such a polarity there mm -hmm. and that's that's what you want for your characters you want them to have to be forced into these situations where they're making 
really difficult choices that they have actually told the reader or the viewer at the beginning that of, they wouldn't. you know, all right, I will never do this yeah. thing. Like yeah. Michael looks straight at the, the audience and says, I will never be like my family. I, I am not my family. They're not me. I'm not my father. I will never be my father. Yeah. And so when you've got that downward character arc, yeah, it's, it's put, crossing those lines, right? You just draw another line in the sand. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you know, it's not that bad. Like it's just one little step forward and then drawing another line and drawing another line and you just continually move them forward until, yeah, it's all gone. Well, and that's what or, made Breaking Bad so fascinating yeah. for us all, right? Because we were watching this guy. I mean, Vince Gilligan's whole log line on that was Mr. Chips turns into Scarface, right? <laughs> and and that's, that's such a slow journey. We see it one decision at a time. And that's what makes it fascinating because you can believe that. And I think in in poorly scripted fiction, you see it where it's either somebody, they arrive at their journey too quickly. It became right. too easy for them. Right. Like if you, if you, and I do this, you know, like on the chalkboard in class, like if I have a, and I draw just a straight line across here, this is my character. And then all of a sudden, right at the end, I have this upward spike of a, of a character arc change. Like all of a sudden they learned something magic there at the very end and changed everything. Like that makes no sense. Right. That, that doesn't feel, uh, doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel authentic. And yeah, you have to, you have to have all these little points along the story where they're making some changes and where, where things have happened that put in motion that they will actually end up where you want them to. Yeah. One of the things that I remember um, we discussed recently, we've run into this with other stories. Uh, two of the stories that I remember this with were the dream engine and um, more recently resurrection, the end of the alien invasion series, which I won't spoil, but um it's like you can't just it's that deus ex machina victory mm -hmm. where it's like oh look how well there's two deus ex machina is just overly convenient in general but then there can also be at the ending where it's like oh look the story came together because of kismet and it was like no we we want you know we want our our hero to earn that victory it can't just mm -hmm. be like oh somebody got hit with a brick at the wrong time and then everything <laughs> worked out it's like no 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 Every, the, the circumstances of the story need to result in those protagonists, you know, moving forward and earning that through their own efforts. And that's something that I've seen in stories that I don't like. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I want to circle back. We we're um, talking about the character stakes. Um, the one we've been working on lately, I won't tell the title or anything, but it has the baby in it towards the end. Yeah. And um, it, <laughs> it's a, I think, you know, like when I was reading it, I was like, there's, I think that I understand where this wants to go and there's, it's going to be a big element, but the baby comes along, the girl gets pregnant, the, the baby's going to come or whatever, you know, like, uh, but there's nothing that's changing. It's like baby comes along, but okay, baby's here, baby, you know, like, uh, there was no difference for this woman, like that here's a problem, but the problem wasn't happening. It was just okay, like, so, right, yeah, I'll, I'll actually speak to that. A little I have bit. no idea what this is, but sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, yeah. Johnny doesn't even know this story. Neither does Dave. Um, but, but yeah, so in this particular story, the pregnancy was not part of the story. It was not part of the beats. It was not in the outline. And so it was something that just happened during the draft. As and pregnancies so, tend to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. It was a very typical accident. Uh, <laughs> but, but when you have that, it's kind of hard to, uh, it, you, you're, it's not set up the same way, right? It's an right. accident. So that kind of thing, you have to allow that to happen in your story. You just can't ignore it. Then it's a matter of how do I do the right things in revision that are setting that up or, um, you know, because it's not like this character ever said, um, I hope I never get pregnant. Because if, if she said that earlier in the story, then her getting pregnant means something, but she mm -hmm. never said that because we didn't know she would be pregnant. So if those things happen in your draft, that's perfectly fine, but you yeah. have to go back and make sure that it's not just random thing that happens on page 321 because your reader's like, what? Like it doesn't have any gravity to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's making it make sense um, and have a reason. I, and I really do love the idea, you know, like you don't have to be cemented to your outline, right? You know, like right. you're writing along, things change. Like you discover things about your characters and all of a sudden those things are really awesome, but you have to make sure that you're going back and fixing the other chapters to make it as impactful as possible. Uh, look at that. Everybody stopped at yeah, exactly the, the, I'm the just same, trying to give other people the same time. To talk. Well, I, uh, Dave, you go yeah. now. Uh, I do uh, have something I could ask, but I want to go ahead. I, I don't think we really talked about how uh, Clark got into this, did we, in the beginning? 
No, we did not. Tell, tell us a little bit about it and some of uh, the people you've worked with, if you're allowed to. I don't know if you have like NDAs and stuff. So um, it was a really different kind of experience to get here. So, uh, of course, I started in journalism. And then I got totally just... Uh, I love your voice, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. He makes us all seem unprofessional. Yeah, Johnny actually slacked um, superlatives about your voice when you first got on call. Oh, well, and you're all composed and professional and not a jackass like us. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, uh, the voice was just given to me. Like, I, you know, it's not something that anyone can have. Um, <laughs> they will pay handsomely, if yes. you way. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I started in journalism. And then, of course, if you've ever worked in journalism, you understand pretty fast that uh, the truth that you're telling is also dependent on the sponsors that you have. Like, like <laughs> it's a very, uh, it's not exactly as truthful as you think. And so I got kind of tired of that. No, what? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's oh just such God. a weird feeling. So, uh, jumped over to start building houses right at the time that the, the bubble collapsed or the bubble popped with the, the housing market. And then I went and joined the army. Journalism job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I went and joined the army and um, I was getting ready to deploy to Iraq. And I had two little boys, you know, that were like two years old and seven years old. I'm like, goodness, you know, uh, I was getting in the mindset of not coming home. And so I was like, if I don't come home, they'll never know who I am. And so uh, I, I took the time to, to write out all the shit in my life, all the good stuff, you know, what I'd want to give them as advice, everything. And, um, and then, of course, when you're in a war zone, like the, the, um, the feelings definitely come along pretty strong on a regular basis. So I turned to writing fiction. And um, that's what got me into writing. And again, you know, like coming forward from that, uh, a really bad experience with a couple of uh, unprofessional people with uh, gaming the Amazon system there. And then I, I just had a, a deep desire to actually get into uh, learning how to write better. But then along the way, this, the, <laughs> what really got me into editing was I wanted to do a podcast. But there's what, 10 million podcasts on writing, but like none on editing. And so I was like, well, <laughs> we'll just do editing. And, uh, you know, basically we'll just talk to other editors and, and writers and uh, just we'll go at it in that direction. And then all of a sudden I start getting emails from people, you know, hey, could you take a look at this work? Could you do this? And um, so I hate to make it sound like it was just an accident, but uh, it's something that I fell into that, uh, that I wasn't expecting. You know, I was going down my route for being an author. But uh, I really understand all this stuff. I really understand the intricacies of story and how it works. And uh, yeah, like it just happened. <laughs> yeah, the best stuff in all of our lives, I think, were accidents. So <laughs> it, was, it was sequence. It was secret. Yeah, that's right. It was. Oh, so. so you need a <laughs> hug. That was so great. Yeah. So um, I'm just, we're all so grateful that you're, you're here because I think our stories will get better. I think our company is better. I think we can, you know, take a breath and do some other different things. Um, so our whole better stories faster is just, it's great. And, and on the story jacket thing, I guess we do need to close out soberly there um so despite all our earlier shenanigans um clark uh, it's it's two two per week right that's kind yep. of like your your bandwidth I like. yep yeah so so we're he is offering story jackets um and they're two per week so you have to go to uh, sterlingstone.net forward slash story jacket and then there's like i think you can get on the schedule um so by all means enjoy um i wouldn't ever want to write anything without a story jacket at this point and i'm glad they have a name <laughs> do we need to give details in terms of like you know you're you're booking further and further out just so you know like clark can only handle yeah so i think it's all on the page and then it just handle happens yeah so sterlingandstone.net slash story jacket if you want details there is a limited number um do you know like how many are left or does any of that matter or no no i think it's just a matter of getting booked out um yeah, Clark was like, fuck that. Don't sell all my time. Yeah, <laughs> right. So it, it's solid through mid-November. So like the next, because we actually offer this to um, our apprentices first, which makes sense. Um, and so there's like a month taken. But um, but yeah, there's there are spaces. And um, if you know you're going to want this within the next few months, I would get on the calendar because um, I don't imagine they'll open up once they're closed. Right. And, uh, and right now it's doing a special price, correct? Um, I don't know. I love or, that Clark not. said that and Sean didn't know. 
<laughs> it's, no. it's not the way it's supposed to happen. <laughs> well, it's because Christine and Amy were kind of taking care of the whole thing. Like, yeah. Really so, so I won't say anything else on that then, I guess. So I don't want yes, to. But for the record, I don't know either. And Amy says, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, so that's it. St- uh, Sterlingandstone.net slash story jacket. And um, I guess that's it. We're done. So thank you very much for being on Clark. You really classed up this joint. Uh, Americans can do it too, right, Dave? Yes. <laughs> some and, uh, Americans have a good voice. Some of them. And uh, so that's it. So thanks for listening to Self-Publishing Podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. There's always, just so 